Good afternoon. Welcome to the seminar this afternoon and welcome to World Dairy Expo. This afternoon's seminar is Are You Buying Your Milk Production? Presented by Dr. Bill Weiss and supported by Quality Liquid Feeds. Uh, my name is Joe Wiest and I've been with QLF for 30 years. Um, so I've got some pretty good history with QLF as well. Um, today's seminar, um, as the largest single cost on a dairy farm, feed and its impact on milk production are front of mind for dairy producers. While feed costs in dollars per pound of feed and milk production are positively correlated, the relationship is not strong. This means feed costs vary substantially among farms who have similar production levels. Bill Weiss, a professor of dairy nutrition in the Department of Animal Science with the Ohio Agriculture and Research Center, will discuss different means of keeping feed costs in check without adversely affecting milk production, while also uncovering opportunities when spending a little more on feed can result in large returns. The seminar has been approved for continuing education credits from the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists and the American Association of Veterinarian State Boards. Forms are available in the back if you're interested in the race credits. I would like to ask everyone to silence their cell phones at this time and another brief introduction on Bill. Bill's a professor of dairy cattle nutrition at the Ohio State University. He earned his BS and MS degrees from Purdue University and his PhD from Ohio State. He has been on the faculty of Ohio State since 1988. His main research areas currently are importance of variation in cow and diet factors and diet formulation, factors affecting digestibility in dairy cows, and relationships between minerals and vitamins and health of dairy cows. He has authored more than 125 journal articles and more than 350 popular press and proceedings articles and has given talks in 40 states and 29 countries. He was a member of the 2001 NRC committee and is currently serving as vice chair of the 2016 Dairy NRC committee. Dr. Bill Weiss was honored numerous awards including ADSA Fellow Award, ADSA American Feed Industry Association Award, the Ohio State Extension Award of Merit, and the ADSA Applied Dairy Nutrition Award. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, and we'd ask you to uh, hold all your questions to the end, and we'll have a five to ten minute period that uh, we can try and get them answered. So go ahead, Bill. Uh, thank you. Um, I didn't wear a bucka or a bucky shirt, but <laughs> I did wear my Packers. I don't know. <laughs> Even though I like the Vikings. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to talk about cost. This is the title was, that was given to me, and the answer is, of course, you're buying milk. You're, there, there's no free lunches in this world. And, and I just picked him, and you can put any politician up there. They're all the same. So what we're really going to ask is, are you paying too much? And what can you do? And I'm going to really try and come up with not just general things here, but numbers. This is what this would cost. This is what this will cost. So there's going to be an emphasis on actual numbers, not just concepts. Um, come over here. These are the big picture things here that affect feed costs. One is milk production. Cows that produce more milk, it usually costs a little more, but not, not as much as you think. We're going to talk a bit about that. Feed cost or the cost of the ingredients is a player. The biggest one, though, is forage production. The cost of forage production is the biggest driver of ingredient cost. We have the nutritionist, what he balances for. Or is, how much extra is he balancing for? That has a cost. And then really brief on some additives here. This is a big data set out of Purina. And this is production per day per cow in, in kilos. And this is their cost, total cost for just the lactating herd. Heifers and, and dry cows aren't in it. And you can see as cows produce this 35 kilos, that's about 70, 75 pounds of milk. As cows produce more, feed costs go up. They, these cows eat more, it takes a little more. more more nutrition. But what is really interesting here 
is look within, say, at 75 pounds of milk, or approximately 75 pounds of milk, you have heard spending $4 a day, and you have heard spending almost $8 a day, all for the same milk. <clears throat> so, you know, what, why are these guys so cheap? Why are these guys so expensive? And you can look at this just the opposite. You can spend five bucks or 550 a day and get about 45 pounds of milk, or you can spend about 550 a day and get 80 pounds of milk. Again, why, why is this variation? Um, and a big player is forage production, but a big player also in, in the ingredients you pick, the, the rations you formulate. So there's a lot of room here to go from, let me back up, to go from up here to down here with no effect on milk. You know, if, if you, you drop feed cost and you lose milk, you're losing. But there's a lot of opportunity to go from high feed cost to lower feed cost and maintain production. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to start with the biggie, and that's for, uh, for, uh, forage. We, we've been looking at nutrient prices and feed prices in Ohio, and I, and I think this fits the Midwest in general for over 20 years. And almost every month we do this, corn silage ends up being cheap. It's a cheap source of nutrients, almost every month for 20 years. So obviously this is a feed you want to feed, and you want to feed a lot of it. <clears throat> alfalfa, homegrown alfalfa, not purchased alfalfa, but homegrown alfalfa is almost what we call reasonably priced. It's not cheap, a cheap source of nutrients, but it's reasonable. You get what you pay for or a little bit more. So taking advantage of, of homegrown forages will, will have a big effect on, on feed cost. The, the underlying assumption here, and I'll get into this a bit, but it's got to be good. Bad alfalfa is almost always overpriced. Bad corn silage is overpriced. So the, the presumption here is that this is good stuff, but use as much corn silage as you can. Good alfalfa also uh, is economical. Okay, so what I did here is say, okay, what's, what's the main drivers of, of cost of corn silage? Because that's gonna affect the feed cost. The production cost of corn will affect production cost. And I'm using Ohio numbers here, and again, they should be similar for the Midwest. They won't be exactly right. But I've got three, three yields here, 18 tons up to 26 tons per acre, 35% dry matter. As you produce more feed, and I'm, I'm assuming that the quality of these three, three different yields are the same. So same stuff, just different yields. As you produce more per acre, the costs go down. Your, the fixed costs are diluted. It goes down a lot, almost to over, over 10 bucks a ton, going from low, low yields to, to high yield. The cost per acre, of course, goes up because you've got more, more, more variable cost. <clears throat> so what I did is, okay, if, if I'm, for this herd, I've got 200 cows, I've got feed replacements, I need 3,000 tons a year. That was my set. I've already put in shrink into this. So at these three yields, 18 up to 26, you would need somewhere between 167 acres to 115. You do take the cost per acre. This would be at, at 18 tons per acre, I'm gonna spend $124,000 to produce that, uh, that corn silage. At 26 tons, it's only gonna cost me 99,000. That's the savings of, of $25,000. Plus, you've got 52 acres left to do something else with. Grow corn, grow beans, something. <clears throat> so using these economics, if you decrease or increase, however you wanna look at it, but if I lose a ton per acre on corn silage without affecting quality, I lose $3,300. <clears throat> At 17 bucks a cow for this, for this farm, plus that's just the cost of growing, plus you lose the opportunity cost of this 52 acres, which again, you can grow something. So I factored that in at, at 800 bucks or four bucks. So a one ton change in yield, again, without an effect on milk, 
is $21 a cow. In Ohio, the average, average margin for a cow is 400 bucks. So 21 bucks increase is, is, is substantial. So yield is, is critically important. We, we often, we keep uh, emphasizing quality, which we should, but we cannot ignore yield. Quite expensive. Oops. <clears throat> but again, this assumptions or this site figures is saying that I'm gonna get the same milk if I feed this corn or this corn, that's the assumption. But there's certain things you do that cost yield, which can increase milk. One example is BMR. You, you are gonna lose yield. There's no, absolutely no question. You will lose yield, you will increase production cost. And if you factor in the added cost of, of growing it, the, 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 the cost of the less yield, the cost of the higher seed, it's going to cost you around 21 cents a day. That will take two pounds of milk to pay for that. You've got to get at least two pounds of milk. They're going to eat more and so on. So the, the data would say in general, you're going to get more than two pounds, again, three or four pounds. So you, you're going to spend 21 cents more, but you should be profitable. If, the big if here is if you have the land. If you have to go find this silage someplace else because you don't have the land to cover the lost yield, then it's often not profitable. So cost more money because of lost yield, but you're gonna get it back in milk, or you're likely to get it back. High cut silage, you know, 20 inches or something. <clears throat> if the average yield of the stuff cut at six or eight inches was 22 tons, you cut it at 15 or 20 inches, it's gonna cost you 14 cents a day. Because again, the production costs are exactly the same. You didn't spend a dime less on seed or fertilizer, but you left a lot more in the field. So you have to pay for that. <clears throat> and again, the data would say, this is not as, as, as clear as this, but this will take about a pound and a half of milk to pay for this added cost of production. The data says, yeah, you're likely to get that but it's not as clear. There's other studies that don't show that. So in these two situations, you're paying more, but chances are you're gonna get more milk. So you do these calculations, but then you've gotta always ask, what's it gonna to do to milk, milk check? Okay. Another way we buy feed is we, we feed concentrate. This is an old study, but it really, I, I really like this because it, it shows, shows an important concept here. They harvested alfalfa at what we today call just okay stuff, 40% NDF, 24 protein. It's good, but not great. And then they harvested alfalfa at more mature at 46. So I'm calling this high quality alfalfa, medium quality alfalfa. And then what they did is they took everything they knew and said, how can I make this stuff feed like this stuff? And, and I'm not gonna get into all the, the details here, but this is a very high forage diet, 70%. Uh, this is out of California, so they fed barley instead of corn, and some minerals, that was it. The other diet they had to get much more complicated on, barley, some cotton seeds, some cotton seed meal. And the goal was to make Cows fed this behave exactly like cows fed that. That's what they were trying to do. Can I make lower quality alfalfa feed like better stuff? And they were successful. They did exactly what they wanted to do. Cows ate the same, produced the same amount of milk, produced the same amount of fat and protein, and the body weight change was the same. So as far as the cow was concerned, these two diets are exactly the same. And again, that's what they wanted. Oops. <clears throat> but then what about cost? The net, the, the gross will be the same. Gro same, everything is the same. This was a 14 week study. So these numbers are for 14 weeks per cow. They had to feed 750 pounds more alfalfa dry matter. Because again, this is a high forage diet. With the lower quality alfalfa, they fed, or excuse me, with the higher quality alfalfa, they fed 200 pounds less barley per cow for 14 weeks. 
450 pounds less cottonseed for 14 weeks and about 270 pounds less cottonseed meal for 14 weeks. When we put today's prices on, not, not prices from 1986, but today's prices, and I did add high quality alfalfa cost more than low quality. You're giving up yield, so I adjusted for that. Over this 14 week period, you're spending about 90 bucks more for alfalfa. You're feeding more of it, it's better stuff. But you're feeding, spending 24 bucks less on barley, 67 bucks less on cottonseed, 45 bucks less on cottonseed meal. <clears throat> so you got the same net, some your same gross, but it cost for 14 weeks about $50 more per cow to get that milk. In other words, this lower, this stuff here, you can get milk out of it. We know how to feed lower quality forages and get milk, but it cost. It cost in this example $50 per cow for 14 weeks. So we can buy milk with concentrate. It's cheaper to buy it with forage, though. But it's got to be good stuff. So let's look at the other end. This year is, you know, forage may be short in, in short supply this year because of weather. So in this experiment here, this was a, a mineral experiment that some of these feeds are a little goofy. We fed a high forage diet. 64% forage, corn silage, and good, good alfalfa. This was a, about 38% NDF alfalfa. Uh, corn and bean meal, and then minerals. That was it. Then we put together what we call the byproduct diet. It had the same corn and alfalfa, but at much lower concentrations, 35%. So this is a very low forage diet. No corn, and we fed oats instead of corn for, for the mineral reason. But I, 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 don't, I see no reason why this wouldn't have been the same results with a corn-based diet. But we fed some oats, bean meal less, uh, corn gluten feed, beet pulp, and soy oil. So we're getting a lot of the fiber from these byproducts. Here we got fiber from forages. <clears throat> Again, on paper, these two diets are exactly the same. They should, on, on paper anyway, they produce the same amount of milk. Well, they kind of did that. Not exactly, though. Intakes weren't, weren't different. Milk production wasn't different. But we lost half a pound of fat, milk fat, per day. And milk fats are extremely valuable. We kept the protein, but we lost milk fat. But this diet, these things are cheap. Gluten, beet, beet pulps, marginally cheap. So oil, these are cheap. And so we actually cut feed cost by, that's uh, 12 cents. Forage, we spent a lot less on forage because we're feeding a whole lot less of it. We fed more concentrate. The concentrate cost is more per pound or per day because we fed so much less, but it's a cheaper per pound. So we put together a diet that's 12 cents a day cheaper. But don't forget this. So as this is a case where I saved 12 cents by not feeding forage, but I lost a buck 30 in milk fat. This is a no-brainer. This wasn't a smart thing to do. So the question you should ask is, okay, if I need to buy, if I have limited forage, and if I, if I don't have the forage, you're likely going to lose milk fat, how much forage can I buy? And in this example, I could buy a, I could spend a buck twenty on forage and be equal. I, you actually want to spend less, or you, you know, want to make, make a profit here. <clears throat> but the, this case, I, if at alf, if alfalfa was four hundred bucks a ton, I could have bought six pounds of that. Taken out some of this stuff, I'd, it would have been break even. Then I would have fed, fed, my feed cost would have gone up. I would have lost less milk fat. So think, just because forage is expensive, more expensive than byproducts, sometimes it's a better buy when you look at the total cost or total return. So, again, I don't know what alfalfa sells for up here in Ohio. It's about 350 right now. 
<clears throat> okay. So forages are still the key, but there's still some, a lot you can do with concentrates. There's a, hundreds of feeds available out there. And the key here, or what we would like to get to eventually, is where we don't care about feed. We don't care one bit about feed. All we care about is nutrients. We're, we're not there that yet. We still, some feeds do not do what we think they should do for reasons we don't understand. But as we get more and more nutrient-based and less and less feed-based, then we can start making a lot of these comparisons. But we still can compare feed cost, but realize that you have to go one step beyond that. I put together here, this is, I, I did this about a month ago. So these costs won't be quite up to date, but probably reasonable. I priced five proteins, canola, soybean meal, cottonseed meal, dry distillers, and blood meal. This was the prices in Ohio, again, about a month ago. And then I said, okay, we're gonna feed these for protein. And so I took the expected metabolizable protein of each of these and said, okay, a ton of this stuff has so many pounds of MP, what's the cost per pound of metabolizable protein? And what you'll see is the three oil seeds are all about the same, about 52, 53 cents per pound of metabolizable protein. Distiller is a lot cheaper, only 40 cents per pound of MP. And blood meal is a lot more expensive, about 70 cents. So when you see this, the questions are, one, are these three really the same? Are they worth the same? Is distillers really cheap? Is blood really expensive? And lastly, is this even legitimate? Is this comparison I made even legitimate? The, the ans I'll answer this one first, and that's no, it's not legitimate because you don't just get protein from these feeds. You get energy, you get minerals, you get other nutrients. So you can never price things just on a single nutrient. You get very misleading information. I'll address these other ones in a minute. So this, this simple where you take the pounds per ton of it and then take the pounds of the nutrient of interest in a ton and do the math, don't do that. You have to look at everything all the nutrients provided by these feeds. And we have mathematical so or software to do this now. The, the math actually is complicated, the software is easy. So you, you put in the feeds, you put in the composition, you put in the price, and it spits out an answer. Uh, we have a method, Ohio State has a method, Wisconsin has a method, they're different methods, but they give you almost the same results, almost the same. So this is step one, but then you have to go beyond and look at, okay, do these things really do the same? Is, is the protein or is canola the same as soybean meal? So on. That's much more difficult. And then lastly, you look at will it over, reduce overall diet costs without affecting milk? For example, you might have, um, you know, soybean meal might be really cheap. But if you've got a lot of alfalfa, you may not need much protein. So you've got to look at the total diet, but I'm going to emphasize these two. Oops. So with the Ohio system, and again, there, this is available at UW's website as well. It's a different, different software, but again, I, I keep track of these things. They aren't very different at the end of the day. But once every two months we, we run this program here and what it spits out is the cost of nutrients. Not the cost of feeds, the cost of nutrients. And there'll be a table in there. I, again, this is a little old. I, I put these slides together a month or so ago. But in August for Central Ohio, and these, there are local markets, so. But in Central Ohio, energy was worth on average 11 cents. And what that's saying is it doesn't matter where you get the energy, whether it's fat, corn, alfalfa, or straw, on average, it's worth 11 cents per megacal. Uh, metabolizable protein was worth 23 cents a pound. Effective NDF is 12 cents a pound. Non-effective NDF is a negative. This is because feed, 
you know, the, the drivers of the feed market is not dairy cows, it's chickens. Chickens drive the feed market. Chickens don't like fiber. So fi concentrates with fiber are discounted because the chicken people don't want them. So that's why this is negative. But we get these prices and then we just, just basically sum them up and get a total price or what we call value of the feed. Okay, so instead of looking at a single nutrient, like here, we're gonna look at multiple nutrients and come up with a single value for a feed. And so what I did here, <clears throat> I got the same five feeds. The blue is the market price. That I, I, when I did this again about two months ago, a month or two so ago, it was the market price in central Ohio. So again, canola is about 260 a ton. The red bar is what, when you calculate the value of the nutrients. In other words, when you add up the, the value of the energy, the value of the protein, the value of the fiber. When you add all that up, that sums to the value. Canola cost 260, but the nutrients were only worth about 220. So what that says is you're paying $40 more per ton for canola than you should based solely on nutrients. Cotton seed, you'd pay 25 bucks more a ton. That's these green bars. Bean meal, 12 bucks, which statistically is getting to where it's about equal. But in general, the oil seeds are worth less than what you're paying on, on this first blush here. Distillers, though, it's worth 66 bucks more than what we were paying. Blood was worth almost $290 less than what you, it, the, the value of the nutrients were $270, $290 less. The problem with blood is you don't feed blood meal for any of these. You feed blood meal for amino acids. And we don't, we can do that, but the, we, we can put amino acids in this, but this wasn't done that way. So this really isn't a comparison, a fair comparison for blood meal, because you'd really put in the price of lysine and the price of methionine, and I didn't do that here. So I'm not gonna get into blood, but this may or may not be overpriced, because you have to compare it to, to feeds that provide the nutrients of interest. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into blood. But the question is, with diller, distillers being 66 bucks underpriced, is it really worth it? And is bean meal really worth, you take the math here, that's 27, or $27, is it really worth $27 more than soybean meal? Or, okay, let's start with canola. I'm feeding 5.6 pounds a day because that's what they did in this study. I can feed canola or cottonseed meal in balanced diets. The canola was fed at 5.6 pounds, the cotton seed had been fed a little bit letter, less because I balanced the diets. Canola diet will cost me six cents more a day. And I'll, I'll come back to this in just a second because it's overpriced by about 40 bucks. Cotton seed's only overpriced by 25 bucks. So canola will feed, cost me six cents more a day. But based on this study and other studies, I'm gonna get 36 more cents worth of milk components. So I'm spending six bucks, six cents, but I actually am making 30 cents. So in this case, the expensive feed actually is substantially cheaper than the less expensive feed. So we have to look at, does, does these, when I do substitution, do you expect the same milk? When we look at canola versus bean meal, same inclusion rate. Canola is going to cost me eight cents more a day. It's going to yield about 11 cents. So now you're talking about three cents difference. In this case, I'm going to say there's no, no statistical difference there. So canola or bean meal, you're going to get the same net, but not with cottonseed. It's worth less than what these others are done. So don't just look at price. Talk to the nutritionist and say, What's the, what does the data say about substitution? Will I get the same amount of milk? Distillers was really cheap. Again, I'll, I'll come back to this in just a second. 
66 underpriced compared to soybean meal, which is $12 overpriced. If you add those up together, that's $78 difference in, in price or in value. So the question is, is distillers worth $78? Or should I spend $78 less per ton with distillers? Is that a profitable decision? The first thing I did is say, okay, let's get rid of all the bean meal and let's feed distillers. Let's feed, do everything we can, balance the diet the best we can, but total substitution. Uh, this is a corn silage alfalfa diet, mostly corn silage. <clears throat> The distillers was almost 29%. And again, this was a balanced diet on paper. What I substituted out was about 9% 9, 9 bean meal, about 7.5% 7, 7 soy hulls, and about 3% fat. So the nutrient composition of this, or this, is the same as this. That's, so again, on paper, these diets are exactly the same in nutrients. <clears throat> this is going to save me a buck thirty-five a day. A feed cost will be a dollar thirty-five a day less than this. That's that's substantial. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. This is going to cost me this much distillers is a buck thirty-five. This is going to cost almost two ninety. The difference is one fifty-five. So this distiller diet is a buck and a half cheaper per day than the soy diet. Buck and a half. That's real money. So this is the feed savings, buck and a half a day. However, this is the money I'm going to make from selling milk fat. I'm going to get nine bucks, and this is based on the, the data from this study, nine bucks, but with distillers I lost two dollars worth of milk fat. I lost a, a, an in, a statistically non-significant amount of milk protein, but the net, when you calculate the loss in milk income, feeding this cheap diet, saving a buck and a half a day on diet, ended up costing me almost 30 cents a day net because of this huge negative effect on milk fat. So again, cheap doesn't mean profitable. That was 100% substitution, which is really stupid to do. But we're researchers and that's what we're paid to do. Um, so let's be more reasonable. So let's take distillers at a 10% inclusion rate. <clears throat> Feed costs now are going to be not this buck and a half a day less. It's only going to be somewhere around 25 to 50 cents a day depending on prices. At this inclusion rate in a well-balanced diet, we don't expect effects on, on milk. We don't expect effects on component yields. So in this case, yeah, this is, is definitely worth it, and distillers is worth 100 bucks more a ton than soy, soy hulls, and fat fed in a reasonable diet. So again, cheapest diet isn't necessarily, is usually is often not the best diet. But distillers is a cheap feed, and including it will usually reduce feed cost without affecting milk yield. There's some problems with these things. And this, again, I'm using the Ohio system. You get almost the same ranking with the Wisconsin system. These are the feeds last month in August that were deemed cheap. You get a lot more nutrients than what you're paying. Corn grain, corn silage, distillers, feather, gluten feed, hominy, and mids. We know feather meal is not a good feed. It is not a good feed. You will lose milk. That should, no matter how cheap it is, you're probably not going to feed that. I talked about the negative effects of distillers. At high inclusion rates, you're going to lose money by feeding distillers. At modest inclusion, it's good. Wheat mids have some issues. So oversupplying, over, just because these feeds are cheap, doesn't mean you go whole hog. Be reasonable. So. Look at these feeds when they come out and say these are cheap, ask yourself or ask the nutritionist, are they really good? On the other hand, we also print out, and, and Wisconsin does the same thing, they print out these are feeds that are overpriced. 
Feed pulp, blood. Blood, I explained, it could be overpriced because it's, we don't give value to lysine. Canola, I talked about canola. It's overpriced, but you get more milk. Uh, citrus, because we don't live in Florida. Uh, fish meal is almost off the market now for dairy. It's being fed to aquaculture. Uh, molasses and tallow. But molasses does, again, all we're pricing it on is energy, protein, and fiber not sugar or not the effects on milk production. So molasses, even though on a nutrient basis is overpriced, on a milk basis it might not be. So don't exclude high-priced feeds without thinking about what's the response to the cow. Okay, shifting gears here a little bit. Fresh cow diets. <clears throat> These are diets up to about three weeks. Uh, we went in this experiment 25 days just for an experimental reason, but first three weeks. These diets can be extremely expensive diets, but you're only feeding them for three weeks. Keep that in mind. And I don't want to go into the details here, but we fed uh, a modest amount of protein, uh, a high amount of protein, and a medium amount of protein plus amino acids. <clears throat> formulated these diets and fed them just again the first three weeks. This is the cheapest diet. These two diets are pretty close in price. Oops. <clears throat> and sorry, these are in kilos. <clears throat> but what we saw was the biggest effect was these high protein diets here. This got moved. Um, we got more uh, milk percent. And we got about a half a kilo, 250 grams, um, that's about a half a pound, more fat from feeding these higher priced diets. So I spent more money, but I get more milk fat, and my net was 20 cents. So more money. Or uh, this high priced diet paid off. But what we did, we, we did these for 25 days, and then we threw all these cows on the same diet for the next up to 84 days. So now they're all fed the exact same amount. Look down here at milk fat. We were still getting, uh, it's about 120 grams, a quarter pound, more milk fat. And now we're not paying anything for it. We paid for this in the fresh period. So sometimes these fresh cow diets have long lasting effects. So again, don't be afraid to spend some money on a three week fresh diet. The, the other thing here, this 3-MH is an is a, is a amino acid uh, byproduct, metabolite, that shows up in the blood when cows break down muscle, or when you break down muscle, 3-methylhistidine. Uh, so high numbers mean the cow is mobilizing body protein, which is not good. So furthermore, when we fed these high proteins, we reduced catabolism of body protein. I don't know how to price that, but there should be a value there because these cows lost less muscle. So long term, that may have benefits. Another experiment here where they even went further. Control 16, again, 21 day fresh diet, 16, 19, 21% protein, a extremely high protein diet, mostly from bean meal plus a few other specialty proteins. You can see uh, bypass protein went up, metabolizable protein went up. But this is model predicted protein balance. Cows in early lactation don't eat much, they produce a lot of milk protein, so if we use a low protein diet, in theory these cows are losing 250 grams of protein a day from their body, half a pound a day. At 19, it's still negative by about, that's about a quarter of a pound. The 21% diet ended up being neutral. In other words, we, we, they had to feed 21% protein to maintain protein balance in these early lactation cows, according to the old, old systems. Look what happened. High protein stimulates feed intake. High protein gets, a, gets a, knocked a lot because of, of environment and cost, but high protein increases feed intake. It increases digestibility. So these high protein diets, they ate about, oh, that's about what, five pounds more? 
You got a very big bump in milk, almost uh, 10, or more than 10 pounds. On fat corrected milk, about 10 pounds. Milk fat percent, this isn't pounds, this is percent, went down. So these high producing, or this, these high protein diets produce less milk fat percent, but because they produce so much more milk, they produced a third of a pound more fat per day. They produce six tenths of a pound more protein per day. That income here from this was $2.30. This is not cheap. So it cost a lot more, but they still netted 80 cents a day from feeding a 21% protein diet. The 19% probably was actually more profitable. But high protein, expensive diets, fresh period usually pays. Now, if you'd be thinking a lot of times high production in early lactation isn't necessarily a good thing because it sets cows up for ketosis. In this study, the, this is NEFAs, this is ketones, the highest blood NEFAs was with the lowest protein, not the highest. The highest blood ketones was with the lowest protein diet, not the highest. So this would say this isn't a, a risk for ketosis if they eat more, and they usually do. So high protein, early lactation usually pays, and very high protein. Lastly, here on feed additives, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. You can spend a lot of money on additives. Just add everything, add everything up. It's a lot of money. And I'm not going to go through all these. I'm going to go through what you should think about. And to me, it's three things. When somebody's selling an additive, I want to know three things. Cost, the return, and how often it works. Those are the three critical questions. So here's, here's three examples. I've got a cheap product, five cents. If it works, you're going to net 20. That's a very nice return on investment, but it only works 25% of the time. So three, three farmers are going to spend a nickel a day and it's totally wasted, or one farmer is going to get 20 cents. Product B, very expensive, very nice return, and a reasonable consistency. But again, one out of four farmers are going to spend 30 cents and lose 30 cents a day. And then product C is moderately priced. The return isn't great. This is a net. The net is, is not great, but it always works. So th this one is a no-brainer. There's no risk. You invest 10 cents, you get back 14 cents. No-brainer. Because you're almost guaranteed it's going to work. These two are much more questionable. This thing here that's expensive is before I would go, go into this one or use this one, I want to be able to say I can find the difference. In other words, I'm going to feed it and I'll be able to see it on my farm. Because if it works, it's great. But if it doesn't, I want to stop feeding it. So when something's really expensive, it better have a good return and it better have a reasonable chance of working. This one here is really nebulous, because again, most people are going to lose money on this. And at this rate, you probably will never see it. You'll probably never know if it's actually working on your farm. It'll be buried in the noise. So with these products that they, they hopefully the, the supplier were able to say, okay, we did four studies, it worked on half of them, or something like that. They'll be able to tell you something on consistency. And your goal, or one thing you should really work on, <clears throat> is saying, okay, what set the, the, that 25% of the time where it worked, why? Was this with fresh cows, or was this with high corn silage diets, or was it for, with first lactation animals? So try and figure out to increase your odds of it working. That's the goal. So nothing works 100% of the time, but try and get it, get it to, to increase the chance of return. Um, so again, what I'm going to ask is how often does it work and what's the rate of re expected rate of return? And this is a question to me is essential, absolutely essential, because that says, okay, how likely will it work for me? Okay. Lastly, here is production groups. More groups cost money, they can save money. 
And we're just talking about lactating cows now. The cost or labor, management, and so on. There's been, this is out of Wisconsin, this is mostly simulation data, but let's just look at typical milk price, typical feed price. That's this bar, set of bars here. If I go from a one group TMR to two groups, high production, low production, that should save me about 40 bucks or increase my income over feed cost by about 40 bucks. If I do three groups, I get a little bit more return, but not a lot. It's, it's easy to justify two groups, three groups a little more nebulous, but grouping at least high and low usually pays. But the nutritionist has to do this right, and too often they don't, and so you don't reap the whole reward. The benefit of grouping isn't the three different means, this I'm using a three group system here, isn't the three different means it's the three different variances or standard deviations. When you group by production, you end up with much more homogeneous groups, which means you don't, when you have really diverse groups, you overfeed cows, you overfeed them a lot. When you have very consistent groups, you overfeed them, but you overfeed them a lot less. And I just want to work one example here. One group, 75 pounds, this is the expected variance for normal feed farms. We would say you should balance that diet for 88 pounds for, on protein. If I had three groups, 60, 75, 90, this is averaging 75 pounds, just the same as here. I overfeed the low group by four pounds because it's consistent. I overfeed the mid group by five pounds. I overfeed the high group by seven pounds. When you take the average, the average diet here is for 80 pounds of milk compared to this diet at 88 pounds. That's where you save money, by balancing closer to the requirement. You still overfeed, but you feed closer to the requirement. And if you don't cut the safety factor, if you'd have fed all these groups for 13 pounds more, you lose, you lose money. You feed them closer to requirement. Um, shrink, everybody knows this, cut shrink. $100 feed, if you lose 50% of it, becomes $200 feed. I'm not going to go into all this stuff, but if you buy wet ingredients and you throw a third of it away, factor that in. Okay, so to wrap up here, forage still is the bottom line. Forage is what's going to make or break feed costs. Choose ingredients based on net, not dollars per ton. Some cheap feeds actually end up costing a lot of money. Additives look at rate of return, but just as importantly is consistency. You want a product that has a high probability of working on your farm. Feed fresh cows a, a, a great diet, and great also means expensive because the return is very, very high. So with that, um, Give you about 10 minutes worth of questions. So, any questions on anything? Thanks. Raise your hand if you have questions. Raise your hand if you have questions. And I'll bring the microphone around to you so you can ask it into that. So, this was a very interesting talk. But in some countries, when they have the grains, they actually cook them and then feed it to the cows. Does it have a positive effect on the milk or the These are the starchy feeds like corn and barley and wheat. Right, yeah. mostly it is. Well, they cook everything together, yeah. like whether it's a yeah. canola or cottonseed or some you will, beans. Or the co cooking starchy-based feeds will increase the energy about 2 or 3%. Protein could be positive, could be negative, depends on how much you cook it. Um, so I'd say, yeah, usually heat. Proper heat treatment will improve the nutrient, val nutrient value of these feeds. But protein, too much heat is, is bad. Yeah, and just one more, I think on one of your slides it shows that the wheat has a negative impact. Wheat so middlings, wheat middlings. Wheat middlings, okay. 
And but if that, you feed wheat grains. Wheat grain is, is a fine feed. It has to be fed a little bit different. I'm not going to feed it exactly like corn, but it can be, be a perfectly fine feed. No, no problems with wheat, but it's not going to be replaced pound for pound. Okay. And then one last one. <laughs> the blood meal, what, what is the source of that? Where does it come from? This would be, this was what would be called generic blood meal. Just, it's okay. mostly bovine but it's just generic blood meal. You can get branded blood meal, which is higher quality, but this was just off the shelf commodity blood meal. Great, thank you. Thank you, good question. When you talk about grouping cows and changing groups, if, if you're on a smaller dairy where you can't bring the diet to the pen, you have to change groups. You're saying forty dollars, and you move the cow for say a hundred days, hundred and twenty days at, towards the end of lactation. That's two pounds a day of 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 milk at eighteen cents a pound. Um, would you not lose that by changing the cow's it, social structure and giving her a higher fiber diet? That 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 been fi that's a cost, but that was figured into that. Okay. So they figured. I I can't tell you remember exactly, but they factored in so many pounds of milk lost for so many days based on what's been recorded. So you're right, but that was factored in. Thank you. Any other questions? We've still got a few minutes. Thank you. Can you go back a little bit to the, whatever the measurement was that you said is the cows burning up muscles? I wasn't familiar with yeah. that. Measurement that terminology. That's three three methyl histidine. That that three MH is a product, and it's it's a byproduct of amino acids. That when any mammal destroys muscle, that shows up. So if, if an athlete is burning a lot of muscle, three methyl histidine goes up in their blood. When cows are in, in, in negative protein balance and they're mobilizing muscle this goes up, so it's, it's, a, it's not perfect, but it is an indicator that those cows with the high number are mobilizing more muscle than cows with low numbers. Uh, you said there wasn't a very good way to value feedstuffs on their individual amino acid uh, composition or input into the diet. What's your personal opinion on, let's just say, ruin protected amino acids versus an animal based uh, there, protein. There, there actually is way we can do that. But I'd have to set up uh, what we have to do then in, instead of just putting in protein and energy, we have to put in the amino acid. So we can do that. We, we actually do that. The, the RP, the high, the, the quality RP products are consistent. You know, some of them aren't very good, but they're consistently not good. But some are very good. And so you usually, if you buy a quality product, you know it's going to be 80% metabolizable or whatever. With blood meal on these branded commodity products, those are very consistent. So that would be a, a, a simple price comparison for amino acid. You could do that. Commodity blood, which is what I priced, can be good or it could be total junk. And so I'm going to would discount that if I can. If I don't know what it's going to be. I'm going to discount the value. I'm going to, it's going to have to be a substantially cheaper source of lysine than, say, RP lysine. Because with the, the commercial product, you know what you're getting. Some, some products, again, are branded, and they, they run all these tests. They blend, and it's good. But commodity animal proteins can be very good or very, very bad. So I'm always commodity animal proteins have to be cheap. Okay, I think we got time for one more. If not, we want to thank you thank, for your thank attention. You. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. <laughs> I'll thank my thank myself. Thank you to Quality Liquid Feeds for uh, sponsoring this seminar. There is a survey, I think, outside on the table. They would really appreciate it if you take the time to fill that out for them and safe travels home. Thank you. <laughs>